Uh, it's actually my 35th birthday today, and um, <laughs> yeah, you guys. Um, and as I was cycling over here, I realised that I'm now closer to 40 than I am to 30. So if I break down in tears or go all sad during the presentation, that's, that's, that's why. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the things that I've been doing in the last couple of years. I'm going to talk about some of the products that I came up with um, and pitched on Dragon's Den a couple of years back. And then I'm going to sh show you and talk you through a particular project I did, a bespoke project that I did. Um, see what I did there? Bespoke project at uh, the Science Museum. So I, uh, I went from a very logical degree, which was uh, manufacturing, and I, I'm absolutely fascinated by how things get made. I mean, there's as much creativity that goes into the making of a product as the product itself. So I went to factories, I spent four years going to food factories, car factories, you name it, we went to a factory um, to, that, 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 that makes these things. I, the favourite factory I went to was uh, an opal fruit factory, because um, they've got machines, they've got a strawberry machine and a lime machine and a lemon machine, and they actually look like little people, and they extrude opal fruits out of their mouths, like little square tongues, and then they get chopped up into little squares quicker than the eye can see, and then they're wrapped, almost as they fall, they tumble out of these machines into big bins, um, and we were students at the time, and they said we could help ourselves, so we were loving it. It was really, really good. So I learned how things got made, and then I went to the Royal College of Art, and I studied product design. While I was there, I, uh, I did various projects, but um, I was asked to spend a year looking at the design of school buildings and how money was being spent on refurbing schools and what impact was that actually having on education. And I realised, working with a number of schools that moved into these new buildings, is quite often the architects were designing these fantastic, futuristic, spaceship-like buildings, and inside the class, there were the same problems existing as in the old buildings. So the reasons quite often kids weren't paying attention were the same. They were sitting on the same hard plastic chairs, they had the same caterers, they had the same provision to water, they had all the same problems and they'd been totally overlooked despite this multi-million pound building going up. So I found that quite interesting. Quite often the architects were trying to win prizes um, but they weren't really consulting the teachers and, and talking about what they wanted. And that actually quite quickly um, I identified opportunities to work with the teachers to come up with products that actually help enhance concentration. So that's when my business idea came about and I, uh, I worked on um, various products. This is one that I, I pitched um, on the Dragon's Den program. It's a, it's a school bag and it has a cushion that, um, that's part of the bag. And the idea is you hang it over the back of the chair and then you fold out the padding over the backrest and the seat of the chair and it makes it more comfortable so that um, you're, you're less likely to fidget when you're in lessons. Um, another thing that I found that, that enhances concentration is if you, if you have uh, healthy food, if you have some fruit in your lunch, if you're eating the right things at lunch, it can have an impact. So I surveyed why kids, if they were given a piece of fruit in their lunch, why they wouldn't eat it. And quite often, that if it's bruised or damaged, or if there's any excuse not to eat this fruit, they will use it. So it made me think that perhaps there's a, a design solution to that. So I came up with this, which is a, a fruit-friendly lunchbox. So it protects apples, oranges, bananas. It kind of makes it more interesting, it makes that the kind of star of the lunch. The thing that you look forward to uh, is, is the fruit and the healthy part. Um, and it's quite hard actually strategically to arrange an apple, an orange and a banana in an innocent way. Um, and I think I've kind of managed it there. Um, the other thing is drinking water. You actually lose concentration. Um, quite a, it, it, the, the, the fact is, uh, if it's, you're 2% dehydrated, your concentration levels can drop by up to 20%. So it's really important to stay hydrated when you're trying to think clearly. And uh, it's often, when you see, go into visit a school, quite often after the, uh, after the winter, they turn the heating right up, and you can see the kids kind of, you know, wilting, visibly wilting in their seats um, as they're trying to focus and trying to concentrate. Um, and so I was trying to think, well, what is the one thing that they would remember? You know, I found that they were given a bottle of water, and they would take it in and, and, and forget to drink it. So it would go home, their parents would, would be quite conscious of that fact give them the water and they, would remember, they wouldn't remember to drink it. So I thought, what's the one thing that they always remember? What's the one thing that they, they need in their, uh, in their school day? And the obvious answer is, is their stationery, their pens and pencils and what they need to work. So that prompted this idea, which is called Message in a Bottle. And it's your writing pencil, the main pencil or piece of equipment that you use during the day. Uh, and then you've got a sharpener 
in the lid. So it's a kind of prompt to remind you to drink when you're working and, and highlight the importance of, uh, of hydration. So I decided once I've got two or three products off the ground, I, I was quite persistent in trying to get the products into shops and I targeted John Lewis and I wrote them lots and lots of emails and went and met with them and, and managed to get the products into one store in the Oxford Street branch through really just kind of persistence and getting the price right. And at that point I was trying to persuade them to roll it out to all the stores and trying to get in some other shops and I was approached by the BBC about going on Dragon's Den and I kind of thought to myself if I do this and I don't wet myself or say anything stupid or do anything too embarrassing, it will really be uh, an advert, an opportunity to promote the products and talk about what I'm doing. So I decided to go for it. And it's actually, they set you up for a bit of a fall. They make you as nervous as possible before you go in there. So you turn up at six o'clock in the morning. They put you in like a holding pen with all the other people that are about to pitch. And there, there was, guy, on the day I was there, there was a couple of guys in sweatbands and they would kind of sat waiting and then there was a guy with a Christmas tree in a wheelbarrow um, and I kind of thought unless that thing flies I think we're going to get a real race thing um, and you sit and you don't really want to talk to anybody at, at, at first and then you start kind of mixing and they don't tell you what order you're going to be in so you, you get a five minute warning they come in the BBC researchers come into the room and uh, they kind of pick you out and you're also not allowed to leave the room without their permission. So um, you're sat there and if you need the toilet, you have to kind of put your hand up and someone's on a walkie-talkie, yeah, he needs the toilet, is that okay? And the conceit is you're not supposed to bump into one of the dragons before you pitch. So that's the reason that they patrol it, or that's what they say. Um, but really it makes you very nervous. And as it turned out, the filming was done about half a mile away around the corner. So there was no chance of actually bumping into it any of the investors beforehand. So they, they make you very nervous, they don't tell you what order you're going to be in. And six hours through, they came in and they were like, right, it's your turn. So I'd had six hours kind of stewing, trying to remember all my facts and figures and things. And then they picked me out and put me in. And I think that's the reason why a lot of people go to pieces when you, when you see them on the telly. It's because they've just been stewing for four or five hours. So it was actually a really good opportunity for me to so then I, I got some backing and, and it turned into a great opportunity to get into other shops and expand the product range. So these are the products that I currently sell and uh, there are a whole range of different sort of ideas. So for example, uh, in the corner, this is a sports bag and um, it's a combination of two ideas that have gone before. I sometimes leave my gym kit in my bag for a bit too long and it ends up smelling and it smells like the inside of a shoe quite often and I thought this is appalling I have to come up with a solution for this and a simple solution presented itself I thought well why not put an odour eater the kind of thing that you would find in the inside of a shoe that uh, fumigates it sew one of those inside a sports bag call it a pong patch and, uh, and, sell, uh, and see if that sells and that was, has proved to be a very popular product with uh, John Lewis and Sainsbury's um, that, that brain shaped object is um, I'm always frustrated when you've got a USB stick and you can't quite tell how much data's on it. And I thought it'd be nice if you could just push a button when it's not near a computer and it lights up according to how much data it's got on it. So it's, if it's full up, it's really bright. And if it's empty or dim, you know, it lights up dimly. And then, it, of course, the connotation of it being a brain, a bit like memory, uh, came to mind. So this is a USB stick that lights up according to how much data it has on it. Um, this is a pencil case that I make, created that um, that stands up, it acts like a pen pot, so you can open it out and stand it up and keep your pen stood up. Um, I did these mugs for teachers, so I polled them to get their top three phrases that they have to repeat over and over again. So I printed them on mugs, so they just, print, they just point at the mugs at break time. Um, I also sell pre-chewed pencils. Um, it was a bit of a, a bit of a joke. I kind of thought I'd like to see them in a pristine pack on a shelf, you know, a lovely pack of pencils, but then you kind of look down and suddenly you realize that all the ends are chewed up. It appealed to my sense of humor. So I made a few of them um, and took a picture and put them on my website and somebody noticed them and blogged about them and it actually led to some really good press. So something that started out as tongue in cheek actually turned into a really good vehicle to promote the other products that were doing that were a bit more serious. So there's a whole range of products and they've, they've kind of rolled out into different stores. I also um, wrote a book uh, about famous people that have invented things. And uh, it turns out that people like Margaret Thatcher, 
um, Jamie Lee Curtis, Marlon Brando, Michael Jackson, they've all patented things, which I found absolutely fascinating. I have this idea that, that everybody has a, a product in them, a bit like everybody has a book in them. And researching, I found you know, some really unlikely cases. So Margaret Thatcher, for example, actually invented soft scoop ice cream before she was a politician, um, remarkably. Um, it was, it, she, she, had, she was tasked with figuring out a way of dispensing ice cream quicker putting it through tubes, and she figured out actually if you put air into it, you can aerate it and pump it through the tubes and um, you create Mr. Whippy ice cream, so you remove 30% of the product, but you can sell it for more, um, which I thought was, and then she decided to go into politics. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so she was a chemist by training and then she went into, into politics. And I was mentioning these, th I went to the Science Museum and had a meeting about perhaps using the book or selling the book in the shop and I showed them some of the other products that I designed and we talked about perhaps having a role designing the product bespoke um, science museum a, a range that, that's uniquely science museum, something that's inspired by the collection. So I got this job of being inventor in residence um, and it's a real dream job, I have to say. So 5% of what they have in their collection is actually on show at the South Kensington site. The rest is in storage. So this picture here, this is actually one of six hangars that they've got in Wiltshire, and it was an old RAF base, and it's full of rockets and planes and bits of train and bits of satellite, and it's all kind of stacked up. You know, they park all the cars underneath the planes. It's absolutely incredible. And then there's another site, which is where the spacesuit is, um, and where this picture in the corner was taken in, um, in Blythe, on Blythe Road, which is next to Olympia. Um, and it's just the most incredible place. They filmed Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy there. It's an old post office building, and all the fittings are from the, from the 50s, I think. Um, and it hasn't really changed at all, so it's a really dramatic building. And inside, they store all these other bits and pieces, um, which is fascinating. So there, there's, um, they've got a library of uh, Newton's work. They've got some... Uh, some bits and pieces. This is a sketch by Barnes Wallace of a, 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 a secret plane that he was developing after the war, which um, is uncannily like the kind of current stealth bombers that, that they're using. So it's a real dream job. And I've got to come up with ideas that are uniquely science museum, trawl through these archives and come up with things. So as an example, um, when I walk in through the museum in the morning, um, I walk past this gramophone in the communications gallery and it's just something that struck me is a really beautifully elegant way of amplifying what is quite a quiet sound a needle on a record is quite a quiet sound and this beautiful trumpet amplifies it and it's a very cost effective way of, of amplifying something so that kind of lodged in my mind and then I actually came up a couple of days later with an idea for kids in their bedrooms if they've got you know 10 15 pounds a uh, way of amplifying their phone or their mp3 player so i created this which is the iphone i called it the iGramo, and it's a very simple way of amplifying up your iphone um, another example of a kind of a, a product to pique people's interest in science especially kids um, and uh, I, what i also wanted to do is move the range the science museum range into some a bit more kind of homewares a bit more designery um, so i get very i like magnets i really like magnets and i'm intrigued by them so i came up with this product which is a, uh, a chopping board with a magnetic strip through it in dark wood um, and then you can stick mixing bowls to it and when you're chopping it holds the end of the knife down so you can chop quicker and then when you're finished using it you can use it as a knife rack and stick your knives to it and then I was playing around with that and it, it kind of I pushed it forward and I thought well you've got the opposing side of the magnets now on the other side of the chopping board could you do something with with the, re the repelling side of the magnet so I was playing around some more and I came up with this product which is levitating cutlery. So the magnets pose as magnets underneath the placemat and you get, you know, you can have Harry Potter style dinner parties um, if you wish. And not a very practical product, but just one to sort of inspire kids as to how does that work. Um, some other products I've come up with, um, this is a really simple thing, a timeline of inventions on the back of a ruler. So you get a, an idea of the chronology and the lineage of, of products. And these are word count pencils. So I measured the pencil very accurately, I wrote a thousand words, I measured it again very accurately down in the Science Museum basement uh, in the workshop, and then I extrapolated from that, if you wear the pencil out to here, you'll have done a thousand words, two thousand words, three thousand words. So the kind of scientific method involved in that. So the last thing I'm going to talk about before I 
before I go, is um, just before Christmas, the Science Museum decided that they were going to do an exhibition about Hawking, Stephen Hawking and his work. Um, and he was 70 on the 16th of January. So they had the exhibition lined up. They'd been working for a while to create it. And they decided that it would be a nice idea to also give him something because he was going to come along for the opening of the opening of the exhibition. So they asked me whether in two weeks over Christmas I could come up with an idea for a 70th birthday present for Stephen Hawking. So I learned a little bit very quickly. I spoke to the curators. I was a bit daunted, to be quite honest, about, about taking on the task, but I kind of agreed to it without thinking it through. Um, so very quickly I had to get to grips with the, what his, his key discoveries, his key work. Um, and obviously it's on the study of black holes, but he uh, theorized that there's a particular thing called Hawking radiation, which actually escapes from a black hole. So I learned a little bit about that and uh, spoke to the curators about some areas to look at, and they highlighted a couple of things. So the black hole work is, is obviously quite a key thing. Um, this radiation escapes from a black hole, and light itself is pulled into the black hole like water running down a plug hole, which I thought was quite a nice metaphor, they explained. They also pointed out that he does a lot of work in the kind of subatomic particles, and was very fond of a particular piece of equipment in the museum um, called a Geisler tube. Now a Geisler tube is a bit like a piece of neon, um, and it was used as a curiosity, first and foremost, and then uh, a guy called J.J. Thompson used a similar piece of equipment to discover the electron. So it almost, in, in a sense, it, it gave birth to the whole kind of area of quantum physics, subatomic particles, and it's something that Stephen himself has, has pointed out that he really liked. So this equipment, it's a bit like a light bulb. Uh, it's an evacuated tube. And then we've got some examples at the museum that essentially look like neon, but I think there's a uranium gas inside. Um, so I was kind of thinking through these two things. There's lovely guys, the tubes that look at the quantum and the subatomic, and then the, the cosmological and the, the, the kind of idea of a swirling mass of, of light disappearing into a black hole. And I thought about trying to do some sort of light that uh, he could use, make some practical use of, that pulled these two things together. So in the end, I used neon, and I found a neon sign maker to produce me this, which I called the black hole light. So it's a swirl of light using the same profile. He's got a profile in his lab of how light falls into a black hole, um, and I copied that profile. And um, I got this guy, it was quite a challenge to make, and I was looking around for different people that could do it. And eventually I found this great neon sign maker in the East End. And I started to explain what it was for. And he was kind of interested and he was like, okay, yeah, yeah, it's for the Science Museum. And then I explained it was for Stephen Hawking and he was really excited about it. And he said, well, you know, normally I'm making signs that say girls, girls, girls. So this is a real treat to be doing something a bit different. <laughs> um, so he was really into it. And uh, we got some other kind of shots of it. This is a close up of it falling into a, a black hole. And then finally I got the opportunity to present it to, um, to Stephen, who he can now just about do a word a minute, so he's, it's very limited the amount of communication that he can have, but he can still give you a withering look. Um, and I was trying to explain how the light worked, and I started talking, and then I thought, if ever there was a time I need to be scientifically and factually accurate, it's probably now. And I kind of trailed off into a kind of dismal kind of... So that's it, that's the end of uh, my uh, presentation, and uh, thank you very much for listening.